Okay, questions? Just start with something. Yeah, go ahead. Um, to be 100% honest with you, we haven't met together, the three of us. We kind of assign like, uh, which topics each instructor should be responsible for uh, before the weekend. We're going to meet either to, uh, today, later, or tomorrow morning to decide. But as I said before, there's going to be roughly between 40 and 50 multiple choice, about 50%. And then the rest will be written questions. Yeah, written question could be, for example, uh, implementing some recursive helper method or to derive the big O. So the exam question, I, the practice question I gave to you over the weekend could be very useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But at the moment, I don't know yet. Yeah, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yes. You mean like an login kind of stuff? Or okay. Sure, you know, that's good. Uh, OK, so the question was really about just more example about a big O. That might be nice. I would suggest the following. Number one, uh, for n and n squared, you can definitely see example from the lecture slides. That's one category. For n login, I'll talk about it. How about merge sort, since I didn't get a chance to co uh, cover that in the class. But you know, nothing new, just a different algorithm to talk about. Okay, I'll talk about n login. And for n cube. You may want to look at the exam practice question I gave to you. That one's a slightly more challenging one to get you somehow over prepared. You know, you'll rather be over prepared for the exam, right? Okay, let's talk about the n login case. Okay, I'll, I'll go over that very quickly, right? It's uh, although it's not exactly covered before the break, uh, I mean before the, before the exam period, but that one there's quite use, uh, quite useful stuff to know. Okay, so let me just go over a little bit slides with you. Okay, about the uh, uh, merge sort. Okay. So the slides to look at would be if you go to the recursion slides and then towards the end. Okay. Let's go for that one. Okay, if I go for the recursion slides over here, okay, if you go towards the end. Everything has been covered until uh, so we also did binary search. That was the last thing we did. Okay. Again, uh, just again for reference. Tower of, uh, of Hanoi is a very classical recursion problem. This problem here is completely optional. So I would say, take a look. It might be good for your knowledge to learn about recursion. It's quite a challenging one. Also, I made the source code available to you as well, just for your knowledge. You can study that, and you can maybe talk to me offline, okay, to talk about the Tower of, uh, of Hanoi. What I would like to talk about now is about the merge sort. How about we do that very quickly, okay? It wouldn't take long. And then I'll do some little bit demo together with you as well. Okay, recursion, merge sort. So first of all, let's understand what the problem is for the sort. Basically, we are trying to solve the same problem, like for selection sort and uh, insertion sort. And what we said before, we remember what the running time is for merge uh, selection sort, insertion sort, n squared quadratic. So what does quadratic really mean? Let's again uh, review this. Okay, let me just tell the story. We talk about, before the exam period, we talk about selection sort and insertion sort. So we got selection sort, and also we got insertion sort. Even though they work quite differently in terms of the algorithm, but it, they add up to be the same. Big O of n squared. Okay, to make it a little bit more concrete, what does, really, what does n squared really mean? So let's say if you got 1,000 elements in the array as an input, you want to sort an array of 1,000 elements. So what would be the worst case of the number of iteration you have to run for this? So that would be 1,000 to the power of 2. Okay, so that would be 1 million. So that means it's quite expensive to run the selection sort and insertion sort on a large size of the array if you want to do the sorting. So what we want to see is a different algorithm. Okay, for your information here, so we're going to talk about merge sort. Before I talk about how exactly it works, I'll just mention some statistics to you. So merge sort over here, the running time is going to be big O of n log n. Okay? Asymptotically, this is much more efficient than n squared, like in selection sort, insertion sort. Mathematically, how do you see that? So now let's say we still talk about, let's say, n elements in the array, the same. Let's say we talk about 1,000 elements over here. 
So what will be the worst case number of iteration we're going to do? It's going to be n, 1,000, multiply log 1,000. And log 1,000 is roughly speaking just 10, okay, base 2, because 2 to the power 10 will be uh, 1024. So now this will be just be 10,000 as opposed to 1 million. Okay, if you increase the size of the array, you can even see uh, the, it, the advantage for n log n. So now what we want to see is how merge sort works. One more information for you. Uh, of course, it will be very nice for you as a computer science major to know how to implement merge sort yourself, which I'll show you. However, sometimes if you don't have the chance to uh, implement merge sort from scratch, the things you have been using maybe is called arrays. There was a class called arrays in Java API that sort. This guy here uses merge sort. You can confirm by just going to the API page for arrays class and go to the sort method. They will tell you they use merge sort under the hood. It's n login. Much more efficient than selection sort and insertion sort. Okay? All right. So let's see very quickly how the merge sort should work. And I'll trace uh, the code a little bit together with you. And then let's talk about running time as well. Okay? That's basically uh, something I already prepared. So let's do that. Okay? The, how the merge sort works goes like this. Okay? Let me go to the example right away. Okay? Let's say you want to sort this particular array with a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. You got 8 elements to sort. Okay? Of course, in general, it can be just big N. Okay? It can be 1 million, it can be 1 trillion, it can even be. So the way merge sort works is by dividing into two stages. Okay? The first stage, which I'm going to mark as green, is called the split stage. Split. Okay? The second stage, which is more expensive, is called the merge stage. And for your information, if you go back to your lab number six, you have done something that handles the merge stage. Can you take a guess which one you have done? More merge sorted array. That's something you have done, but we didn't tell you. Okay. Anyway, but of course, in lab number six, the way you did a merge is by use, uh, doing that recursively. But what I will show you as an example is by doing that uh, iter iteratively. Okay. But let's see. Okay. Anyway, so for the merge sort, we're going to get two stages. One is called split. The other one is called merge. The split stage is very straightforward. You keep splitting your list into size of half, basically. Okay, let's try that. First of all, the first stage I'm going to split into two parts. Okay, so first part I'm just gonna, gonna divide that into two. Okay, so the first part is gonna be 85, 24, 63, and 45. Okay, the second part will just be 17, 31. 96 and 50. Okay, just a split. No expensive operation has been done so far. You just split. And let's say, for example, if we use the array list uh, class from the Java library, which I will show you, the way you do split is just by dividing a sublist. Very uh, cheap operation. You can even think about every time you do the split, each one of them will just be big of one. You just split. No copy is necessary. Just the same list. Just divide to half. Okay, now you can think about now we are trying to go down into recursion. The merge sort usually is uh, implemented recursively, but now we want to think about to what extent can we split the list. Well, as soon as this list gets to size one, there's no point to split any further. That's kind of the idea. Okay, so now you can think about given this particular input list, first of all, we split that into two halves, okay, as you can see. And then down uh, through the recursion, we're going to keep splitting them. So now, for this particular list, we're going to split them uh, into two halves. So it's going to be 85 and 24, and also 63 and 45. Okay, And this guy here, it's going to be 17 and 31, 96 and 50. Okay, so far, you can see the order of the elements in the list has not been changed, so they are still unsorted. For example, you can see that this particular list that's been split, it's not sorted yet. And this list is also not sorted. This list is not sorted. This is also not sorted. We just keep sub splitting the unsorted list. Okay, finally, we can split further. Because you can see, even at this level over here, the list is still considered as too large. We just cannot do anything just yet. So what we'll do is split further. So you got a list of 85, a list of 24, 
63, 45, 17, 31, 96, and 50. All right. So now you can see down to the base case level, you can think about, well, just think about we have made uh, several recursive calls, okay? So now, if you look at that, so now I'm going to the merge stage. For a single list of size one, it is automatically sorted, okay? So now this list is now considered sorted. And also, this list is also considered as sorted. So now, how can it somehow return back to the recursion tree? You merge them. That's why it's called merge sort. So now, how do you actually merge these two uh, elements? So now, I will refer you back to lab number six. Remember, you did a uh, merge sorted array or merge sorted list. That's exactly what you do over there. But in lab number six, you did it recursively, but now we just simply do it uh, iteratively. I'll show you the code as a case study. Okay? So now, how we merge them. So, the way to merge them will be, uh, once you merge them, you'll become sorted. So now, rather than these two elements here, you will be 24 and 85. Agree? So now you can see the green list is unsorted. It's in the split stage. But the red elements there is actually sorted after the merge. Okay? Let me just do one, uh, a few more. Okay? So you're going to merge these two as well. So you will get uh, 45 and also 63. And also over here, Merge them, you're going to get 17 and 31. Okay, this case you're lucky, but I'll just put them. Okay, just happen to be sorted already. And for this guy here, also you're going to merge them. So you're going to get 50 and 96. Okay. So now a question for you. A question for you. Very important insight. Think of it, think it the following question for me. So now think about this is... Uh, let me call this level 0. Let me call this level 1. Let me call this level 2. Let me call this level 3. Okay? What would be the running time going from level 3 to level 2? Going from here to here. What would be the running time? A hint for you. Think about how many merges we have done. Are you sure only one merge? What? Yeah, I'm talking about overall. So now, let me make, make my question a little bit clearer to you. I'm asking the following question. When I go from level three into level two, I'm basically merging each of the pair of single element list, right? First of all, how many merges have I done? Four. One, two, three, and four. Effectively, how many elements have I handled? How many elements? Basically, when I merge these two elements here, I've handled two elements, right? When I have merged these two elements, I have handled two elements. When I have merged these two over here, I've handled two. When I have merged these two, I have handled also two. If you add them up together, I got eight. So basically, when you go from level three to level two, I have handled basically eight elements. To actually put it into sorted order, although separately, right? So now eight over here simply just correspond to n. Because imagine that if I give you a slightly different example, let's say rather than eight elements, I give you 16, right? In that case, down to the level, okay, let me make my point even clearer. This is a really important insight before we see the running time. So now let's say this. If I get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, let me make this point very clear. This is really insight into how you can figure out the writing time, sorry. I think that'll be good enough. Okay, let's imagine, so here's eight, okay? I'm gonna put 16 over here to start with. Let's say we start with 16 elements, okay? So now, after the first split, what we will get is, we're gonna get eight in each, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, okay? 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then for this particular one, it's going to be one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. For the other half, it's the same. So I'm going to ignore that. And this one here, also two and also two. Okay? Two and also two. And also one and also one. One and also one. Okay? Should be two and two, sorry. And then one and one. And one and one. So at the bottom here, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's, it's about half of the original list, right? It's about half. Okay? So now, the right hand side of the tree is going to be just a duplicate. So that's why I'll simply just copy that. And now I can illustrate my point. Okay? Just the same over here. Just the same. At the bottom level, how many elements do we have? Always n, depending on how, how large this list it was. Okay? So now, in this case, n is simply equal to 16. So that means at the bottom here, we got 16. So to merge these two, you get to this guy here. To merge these two, you get to this guy here. And eventually, when you get to this particular level over here, how many elements have we handled? 16 elements, right? The same idea. So now, to go from this level to here, you have handled 16, which is n. So now, if you go back to a smaller scale, when you go from this level to this level here, you have handled 8, which is also n. OK? Hopefully, you got that point. OK? Let me do one more level. So now, this level here is good, but now we don't have a single merge, uh, single sorted list. We haven't got that yet, but we will. We're getting there. So what I will do is, I'm going to see 25, uh, sorry, 24 and 85, 45 and 63. I'm going to merge these two lists right, into an, a list of element 4, right, 4 elements. So now, OK, I'm just going to replace this. Would you agree it's going to be 24 and also 45? and also 63 and 85. Agree? That's a, smer a merge and sorted list. How many elements have we handled so far? Four. Just so far. Just half, right? So far, only four, OK? And then we're going to do the other half. So now, rather than this guy here, let's say we execute the merge routine, 17 and also 31 and also 50 and then 96. We have also handled four, right? So now, a question for you. What's the running time? I'm going to ask the same question here. Previously, I, I, I asked about what's the running time when we go from level 3 to level 2. The answer is just n, right? So now, what about the running time from level 2 to level 1? What's the running time? Well, actually, think about how many elements have we handled. If you think about this, when you are trying to merge these two lists, each is simply of size 2. Running time is 4. If you're trying to handle these two lists individually of size 2, the running time will be 4. So 4 plus 4 will be 8. So you still go back to n. So what we have seen up to now is to go from a deeper level to a slightly shallow, more shallow level, you always have to do n because you want to do the merge. OK? So now, over here, you still got 8 in total. OK? 8. OK, finally, finally, you can see we got basically two sorted lists over here. This is sorted. This is also sorted. But I want to combine into a single list. So now what we'll do is we're going to merge them together. So now it's going to be, OK, so I'm just going to replace it. OK? So now the first one should be 17, right? And then we got 24. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And then we got 31. And then we got 45. And then we got 50. And then we got 63. And then we got uh, 85. And then we got 96. So now the same question again. How many elements have we, do we, do we need to touch in order to go from level 1 to level 0? Again, n, right? Because it's only a single merge. Okay. It seems like to go from a level to its previous level it always takes n to do the merge. So now the question would be, how many levels do we have to handle? 
Why is that log n? Uh huh. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, guys. Let me just show a clearer picture for you. Okay, the insight into merge sort is, is to realize to go from one level to the next one, it takes exactly n. Okay, from here to here, it also takes n. From here to here, also takes n. So the question is, how many level of n do we have? It turns out to be log n. Why? Let's take a look. This picture is much clearer, okay? But to really get there, we need to understand how to do things uh, from scratch. So here just shows you in general how things go. Okay, I'll just uh, uh, summarize again, okay? You start with this particular uh, list of size n. You keep splitting. The first split you do is go from n into 2n and n over 2, right? And the second split is go into 4 over n, 4 over n, 4 over n, and 4 over n. But the number of elements you have to handle for each level. For here, it's going to be 2 times n over 2. And for here, it's going to be 4 times n over 4. So it's just the same. Okay? That's why when you want to merge them at each level, it will still take a linear time. So now the question is, how many levels do we have? Okay? You can think about it this way. Uh, as we said last time, so this is the equation to think about. Uh, so here it really shows you, it's big of log n levels, simply because you can think about uh, thinking this way. This one here is simply n over 2 to the power of 1, right? And this guy over here is n over 2 to the power of 2, okay? So somehow the exponents over here tells us how deep the tree is somehow, right? So now, if we go to the bottom level over here, right, it's going to be simply just one, because it's going to be a single uh, element list. So one is simply equal to n over n, agree? Okay? And we can rewrite n over here by, there'll be n over 2 to the log n. Okay? That's why it should be log n over here. Okay, so overall, merge sort is just going to be n log n. For each merge you want to do for each level, it's going to be n. How many levels do you have to handle log n, n log n? I haven't shown any code just yet, but code is actually quite easy to write. Are you okay? Hello? Yes, you okay with the merge sort? Yeah. Okay. All right, so now let me show you the code very quickly. The Java code itself, once you understand how things work, is not too bad. Okay? So now the code looks something like this. Okay? Uh, let me just point to you, first of all, you will have to write a routine that's going to be used by each level. It's called merge. Okay? For this one here, I'm going to refer you to the code. Right? You have done this in a, re, uh, in a recursive way for lab number six, but now we're just doing that iteratively. Okay? I will leave you to study the code. Okay? But the merge is simply just going to merge a list on the left hand side and also another list on the right hand side and both of them are supposed uh, is soon to be sorted okay it's really important so think about the very first time you're going to use the sort is uh, sorry use the merge is here merge like a one element list and then merge like a two element list and then merge like a four element list okay just keep going okay the merge I'm assuming that you're okay right and it would be a very nice exercise to look at the code and think to yourself, why is the merge n linear time? Think about it, okay? So some exercise for you, which, which should be quite easy. Exercise for you. Y is big O of n for merge, okay? So now let's look at the merge sort itself which is actually very short. You can see the code is not long, okay? So we got something called sort, uh, taking the input list, and then gonna return the input, uh, output list. Okay, the list over here may not be sorted. Okay, may not be sorted. And then, let's see. So we just handle base cases first. I remember every time you do recursion, think about base cases first. Uh, usually for collection, it can be either empty or size one. So it would say, if the size is simply zero, 
you simply say just return an empty list, right? Empty list is automatically sorted. And also, if uh, the input list is simply have only single elements, in that case, just create a list accordingly. Just add an element inside, okay? Also, single element list is also sorted automatically. And now, do me a favor. I'll let you take about 20 seconds. Look at the else part over here, okay? Try to have a look. And I have the following question for you. According to this code here, how many recursive calls are we making? Once you have the answer, which should be very straightforward to find out, once you realize how many recursive call we are making over here, try to link that to the animation I was trying to do on the iPad. I'll, I'll link that anyway, but I just want you to think about it. Okay. Okay, another 10 seconds. Okay. Okay, so now let's link. I want you to somehow link these lines of code over here to the uh, the thing I do over here. Okay, I want to link it. It's actually quite easy. Okay, number one, split. You can see over here. First of all, we are trying to say calculate the middle of the list. For example, if you've got size four, the middle should be position two. If you've got size eight, the middle should be position four. Okay. So now these two guys, I want to just use a sublist notation, uh, the method. Okay, you can see I got sublist over here. Okay, this is split. This corresponds to exactly what I said before. I want to split, right? And then I want to split, split, and split. Always split into half. So this part is a split. Okay, keep going for each recursive call. Okay, there's a split. That part is very cheap, okay, just constant time. And then you will see that we got some recursion over here, okay? Recursion is what really makes everything work and also build a recursion tree, okay? So now if you look at that over here, you can see sort to left, and then this one here. So these are, oh, this may not be very visible to you at the back. Let me just use orange. That might be better. So these two calls are recursive, right? So that means once you split them into half, you want to recursively sort them before you can return, okay? And then once you get to the final stage, this is where the expensive bit is for the merge sort. But it's a magic, okay? So now finally, look at that. This part here is to say once you get, you can see over here, once I get sort to left, I'm going to use that over here, okay? Once I get sorted right, I'm gonna use it over here, okay? And then, simply call the merge. Merge them, what's merge? Merge is, merge is exactly over here. Okay, the iterative algorithm we have, okay? Again, so here you see, it's, I think it'd be better for you to understand the illustration I tried to do in the beginning. Try to see what's the procedure for merge sort, and then try to see how you can turn them into recursion. Okay, split them, and then sort them, and then merge them. Okay, that's merge sort. Okay, and then I'll take uh, say a small uh, a few more things. Okay, how do you figure out the running time? I would say this algorithm here is actually more complicated than binary search. So I have two op uh, suggestions for you. Okay, the number one important thing for you to, is to understand this picture here. Why is n log n? Okay, basically for each level, it's gonna be n. How many levels do you have? Log n, so n log n. If you understand that perfectly, I'll be happy, okay? If you want to do what we did in the last class, remember the way we uh, figure out the running time for binary search is by doing something like this, but like a keep unfolding the recurrence relation, right? It turns out unfolding the recurrence relation for merge store is doable, but quite sophisticated. It's on your slides, uh, for your knowledge, I would suggest go through them so you can be over-prepared for the exam, okay? So now, let me just uh, tell you this. How do we stay, uh, formulate a recurrence relation for that time, okay? Let's think about it. If the list is simply just empty, you'll be constant time, just return an empty list. If the list is, has single elements, also constant time, just return a single element list. But what about if I got a list of size n, 
n is strictly larger than 1. So now you will see the following. First of all, this guy here is the merge. Basically, for each level, I'm going to do the merge, which will take n. Okay? There might be some comparison I have to do, so that'll be constant time. Okay? So now you can see also I have to somehow recursively sort each one of them, right? The, the two splits. So that's why you'll see t over here and over 2. So you can think about this part here tells you about a split. And also, this one tells you is the left and right. Okay, so that's kind of the, uh, the thing to look at. Okay. The merge story is a little bit more advanced, but I think it's worth doing. Okay. Will that be covering the exam? Not directly, but I would say to really get used to at least the merge and also try to get uh, used to the recursive thinking for the merge sort. I think that'd be very, very beneficial. Okay? But don't worry, you know, study that a little bit if you want to ask me a question about it, either today or tomorrow or uh, on Thursday. Right? We still got two more sessions. But it's good to mention that right in the beginning. Okay. Okay, that's really the response to the original question. Can we show more example that's more than just n or n squared? There you go, it's n log n. If you do the practice, uh, if you do the practice question I gave to you, it's gonna be n cubed. Okay, that one's also gonna be useful. Yeah. All right, yes. Um, if you go back to the slides for, in the last slides. The last slides, for recursion? Uh, no, not recursion, but for asymptotic. Okay, <laughs> for asymptotic analysis. Yes, I can do that. Give me one moment. The last one, right? Sure. Oh, actually, you know what? I can expand this guy here. Get all the way. Is it this one here? Oh, sorry about that. Ah, somehow it's messed up. Don't worry about it. Okay, let me. Uh... Okay, I think this might be better. Somehow the hyperlink is not really working on my machine, but anyway, okay, go to the last one. Mm -hmm. This one here? Yes. Oh, so that one they just uh, give you a very general. Oh, should be greater than or equal to zero? Is that what you're talking about? Oh, I see. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. You can think about this guy here, and these two guys here are like a special cases for n to the power of k. The reason I put it there just to say in general poly, polynomial is n to the power of something. That something there can be larger than equal to 1, typically. Yeah, yeah the truth of matter is, uh, let me just write it down. Okay. So now, if you say n to the power of k, to be very general, k should be larger than or equal to zero. Because n to the zero will just be one. So that's big of one, basically, right? So n to the power of one, so that'll be n. So that's uh, constant, uh, sorry, linear. And then it goes on, right? Yeah, polynomial, polynomial. Okay. I think so far we have seen many examples about given, given a piece of Java code, how you can figure out the uh, asymptotic upper bound. So just make sure you're familiar with it. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, first of all, which slides are we talking about? I, I, let me just go to that. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Possibly a little bit earlier. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. So guys, this slide here is important. Don't skip that, okay? Don't skip just because it's too mathematical, okay? You want to see that, okay? Uh, this is, first of all, the conclusion over here. So it's a big O of n. Uh, basically, we talk about polynomial over here, okay? So this basically is saying n to the power of zero is a proper subset, okay? So for, the, for those of you who took uh, 1090, 1090 or 1019, 
pop a subset. Okay, let me draw it. Okay. Conceptually, this is how you can think of it. Okay. So now uh, you can think about big O of something over here. Okay. We can put something here. So this is basically a set of functions. which can be upper bounded. Uh, upper bounded by the question mark. Okay, question mark can be any function. Okay, it can be constant, it can be n, it can be n squared. Okay, let's see example. Okay, so now if you talk about this guy here, big O of one, okay? Big of one is actually a family of functions. Basically, all the functions that actually can be upper bounded by one can be included in this family. For example, okay, a very simple question for you to think about, right? That's something you should know for the exam. Should seven be in the family? But how do you prove it? If you, I, I, I agree with you, seven should be included, but how do we prove it? Um, no, that's, that's not the, the way you prove it. Okay, in order to prove it, let me remind you again, okay? Um, yeah, I gotta choose a multiplicative constant C and also the starting point, right? Okay, let me just uh, refer you to that, okay? So all you gotta do is go to this particular slides over here, okay? If you go to slide 19 for your asymptotic analysis over here, in order to prove f of n, for example, seven, is a member of big O of one, okay? How do you prove it? You have to choose a real number constant C, usually integer will be okay, okay? And then you have to decide some integer constant N zero, that's a starting point, okay? And now this is the so-called upper bound effects over here, okay? So F of N is somehow less than or equal to the multiplicative constant C we chose multiply g of n, okay? That should really happen, starting from n zero, okay? Let's apply this right away. Now we want to prove this is a member of big O of one, okay? How do we do that? What about c? What should you choose? Yeah, just choose seven, right? Yeah, exactly. So that can make sure uh, the upper bound effects can occur. Okay, so seven over here can be included. Also, 10, agree? What about one million? Any constant, basically, okay? I'll put one million here. Doesn't matter how large it is, okay? What, what's not going to be included is, oh, as Stefan said, it might be also very useful for you to think about one here is also n to the power of zero, okay? You can think about all the functions that's a, that's a member of big of one will be those whose highest power is strictly less than big O of one, okay? So now, to really make it smaller, you don't have any choices over here, right? Okay, so now that's why, so now if you have, for example, can n be here? n cannot be here, okay? Because you can think about it, so now n is like n to the power of one. Power of one is strictly larger than power of zero, so you cannot upper bound it doesn't matter how large the constant you choose. It just cannot be the case, okay? So now, big of, so this cannot be there. So now let's grow the size a little bit, okay? So the green one is big O of one. So now let's try this. The blue one here is big O of n to the one, okay? So now you can see that over here, I can include, for, for example, seven n plus three. That's the very, very first example we did in the class, okay? And also it can be 100 and minus two, that's also fine, right? So now notice one thing. You can see seven over here specifically. Uh, let me just use uh, pink. Seven is a member of the big O of one. Also at the same time, seven is also a member of this uh, family, right? Seven is also a member of big O of n. So both are true. So this is why when we said in the class, Whenever we want you to de derive the uh, asymptotic upper bound, we want the tightest one, okay? 
because let's say for the merge sort, okay? Let's talk about the merge sort over here. The merge sort over there, so it is big O of n log n. So this is the tightest. Okay, let's talk about insertion sort. Okay, I just want to give you one example. If you talk about insertion sort, the tightest one we decided in the class is also big O of n squared quadratic. Oh, that's also the tightest. So what can happen if we don't always give you tightest? For example, over here, merge sort over here, you can also say the merge sort algorithm is also big O of n square. That's also correct. Not accurate, exactly. So now, if I simply tell you that merge sort is simply big O of n square, so that could be very misleading. So that seems like asymptotically, there's no advantage of using merge sort as opposed to insertion sort. But, so that's why you always should get a tightest. Okay. okay, so now this is correct, but not accurate. Okay, so that's why this uh, set relation is over here. Make sense? Oh, log n, good. Log n is some, somewhere here. Let me redraw it. Basically, uh, thinking this way, okay, again, let me, let me bring some picture into the play. Okay. Let's say this is input size over here, and this is running time. Constant is like this. Okay. This is more like a linear. Okay, something like that. Okay. So now what about log n? It's a little bit like this. Something like that. Yes, I'm, I'm not being very uh, kind of careful with the boundary case. I'm just saying conceptually. But sorry about not being very precise, but I'll refer you to one diagram in the slides. Over there you will see it. But you're right, yes. The diagram you can look into is this diagram here. Uh, sorry, not this one here. Okay, a little bit later. Yeah, over here. Okay. Uh, let me make it a little bit bigger for you. Okay. I think I also talk about this diagram in the class as well. Okay. So here, the one that's at the bottom here, that's a constant, basically just flat. And then this guy here, can you see the this guy here? Oh, sorry. This one. Okay. This one, the white one, you know, it's really getting very slow on the growth. That one's log n, almost the same as a constant time. Okay. What about linear? Linear is basically just another one here. That's linear. Okay. So you can refer to the diagram for the more precise uh, description. Okay. Okay. So go back to your question over there. Okay. So now, how do we draw things like that? So now, think about big O of one. It's this family here. So big O of log n would just be around here. So big of log n is still less ideal asymptotically than big of one. Because log n is still growing somehow faster than constant time. Okay? Because constant never grows. And then this one here, so this will be big O of n. Okay. All right. Yeah, actually that's important. Oh, sure. You mean, oh, I see. Uh, would you mind if I repeat one of the examples? Okay. Might be good. Um, okay. I think you were basically talking about this particular slides that I talk about. Okay. It should be earlier than that. Also, I can refer you to the slides. Okay. How about this? Okay. Let me just make it a little bit smaller. Okay, in this particular slide, we talk about many proofs. How about I just do the first one very quickly? This one here. Okay, 
how do we prove that this is uh, n, uh, n to the power of 2? Okay, let me just copy that to my iPad, bear with me. f of n, 5n squared plus 3n log n plus 2n plus 5. Okay, so now let's say the exam, you might be just given this particular function here. So now the part A, decide the tightest asymptotic upper bound for this. That would be, which one? N square? Okay. Because that's the highest one, right? Okay, good. So now that should be big O of N square. That's part A. Part A is easy, just choose the highest power. What about part B? You want to prove it. How do you prove it? You want to choose the C and choose the uh, uh, N zero, okay? And you, you can simply uh, apply the strategy that we're using, you know, that we, we uh, learned from the class. So how do you prove it? To prove it, you have to choose C multiplicative constant to be something, and also N zero to be something such that we have the upper bound effects. So what would that be? What's the upper bound effects? So that means somehow the running time, which is f of n, okay? f of n is simply this guy here, right? It's less than or equal to c multiply the g of here, n squared. Okay? That's the overall structure for the proof. Okay? Of course, you gotta do this for every uh, well, the same pattern will be applied to every example. Okay? Of course, you got to be careful when you got log, because when you got log, what will be log one? Zero. So you got to be careful. Okay. So that's uh, one of the later examples on the same slide. You can review that as well. Okay. So now for this guy here, how do we prove it? Right. We got to choose this C. And the strategy we talk about is to add up all the multiplicative constants over here together. Right. You're lucky, in this case, it's quite straightforward. You don't have to take the absolute value because they're all positive. But if you refer to maybe the practice questions I gave to you, I think you got some negative value, so be careful. Okay. So now it would be uh, 5 plus 3 plus 2 plus 5. 15? Okay. So now that means this would be 15. Okay, so now what can we choose over here? N0. Usually, you can assume one to begin with, but you gotta double check. If one doesn't work, you may wanna try two. If that doesn't work, you might wanna try three. Okay, let's try one. The way we choose the um, uh, multiplicative constant C over here usually guarantees N zero can just be one, usually. But we're gonna see. So now, let's say we talk about N zero being one. So what we want to do is like this. F of one, less than or equal to 15 multiply 1 squared, right? So we just uh, re uh, substitute n by 1 over here. Okay, so now can we do some quick calculation here? What would that be? So 5 multiply 1 squared plus 3 times 1 times log 1 plus 2 times 1 plus 5. Would you agree this term is simply 0, right? So 5 7, 12. Is 12 less than or equal to 15? Yes. Yes, proved. I believe, uh, in, I'm pretty sure at least in Professor Ma's session, they try to prove things maybe in a slightly different way, but you don't have to worry. Just follow the way we learned for this section. You'll be fine. Okay? If we really got proof question in the exam, we'll grade them separately. So you, you guys uh, will be dedicated to some TA. Yes. Oh yeah, of course. I'm sketching a little bit. You want to uh, put some a little bit more, uh, uh, like an informative description. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good question. So what what do we expect to see in the exam? Okay. Let's say that's what you want to prove. What we want to see number one, we want to see choose c to be something here and zero to be something here. Right. We want to see that. And how do you know the ones you choose was really correct? You want to show this particular inequality over here, okay? As long as we see these two, you're safe. 
which means you get four marks. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so basically, when, when n zero, OK, how about we just do it, since we talked about this kind of exercise already. OK, what about we do uh, the one we set in the, uh, over here? OK, let's look at this one here, OK, this guy here. Let me copy that to my iPad first, and then we'll talk about it. OK, 3 multiply log n plus 2. OK, so let's say you're given this again. OK, so now, what would be the big O? What would be big O? Basically, again, choose the highest power. What's the highest power? Log in here. Actually, you don't even have n. If you say big O of n, it's correct but not accurate. OK, log in. So now I'm going to put log in over here. OK, this part is good. How do we prove it? OK, so now let's try. You want to prove it by choosing c equals something here, and also n0 to be something here, OK? Such that uh, 3 multiply log n plus 2 less than or equal to uh, the C, whatever C you choose, C multiplied by the G. Log n. For n larger than or equal to n0. Okay? Depends on what n0 you chose. Right? Will this formula given to you in the exam? Most likely not. So you better know the definition. Okay. Okay, so now how do we choose the C? Again, you want to choose the multiplicative constant, right? Add them up together. You got three here, you got two here, right? Three plus two, okay? Let's say I choose C to be five. And then what I said before, if you choose using this strategy here, almost always the N zero can just be one, except when you have a log N. You gotta be careful. So this is kind of the case. Let's try. Let me just try N zero to be one to begin with. Let's say you choose that. So now the second part you have to show the upper bound effect is really the case. Is that the case? Let's see, okay? If you claim n0 is simply just 1, so now n will just be 1, okay? n here will just be 1, and c here will just be 5, right? Let's calculate it. So now 3 times log 1, which will be 0. 0 plus 2, 2. 2 less than or equal to 5 times log 1, 0. Is that a case? No. So upper bound effect is not really happening just yet. So what should you do? Don't change the C. I think C is pretty good, right? You, what you want to do is increment N0. OK, so now let's try another one. So what I would do is I'm just going to choose a different color, OK? So look, what about, let's say 1 is not good. Of course, you want to know why 1 is not good. Let's say you choose 2, OK? If you choose 2 over here, so now uh, let, me just, let me copy the equation over again, OK? So it's a 3 times log n plus 2 less than or equal to c multiply log n. OK, so now n0 is 2. So now change this to 2 and change this to 2. And c remains to be 5. So c would be 5. So now do we have the upper bound effect? Let's see. 3 times 0. Oh, sorry, sorry, 3 times 1. Sorry about it. Yeah, log 2 is 1. I forgot. OK, 3 times 1, you can see log 2 over here is 1. So 3 plus 2. OK, you got 5 less than or equal to. So now 5 times log, uh, log 2, also 1. OK, so now 5 less than or equal to 5, good. So now we are fine. So this one here is trickier. Because if you simply tell us you're going to choose the C, and N0 being 1 is wrong. Andrew, you okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we should, so let's say for this example, we yes. that log 1 is obviously 0, so that's why the inequality Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, should we show every single um, step? So let's say n0, let's say uh, mm -hmm. 1 doesn't work. So we should show oh, I see what you mean, yes. Um, 
I would say for this particular question here, I would say maybe in your sketch, you might try one to begin with. Yeah. And then you realize yourself one is not, not going to work, so you'll try two. What about the final answer? Yeah. You don't need to show the intermediate step. If you tell us it immediately it's going to be two, and show the upper bound effects, you're fine. So we, we don't need to show one. Right? You don't need to show one, yeah. Of course, it depends on how we ask you. Yeah. We might say, okay, consider this function here. Why would it not be a valid proof if I choose c to be five and also n zero to be one? So you want to be, you should be able to show why it is not the case, right? Yes. Oh, okay. On the exam, like, mm -hmm. uh, like I know we can get like a question about induction. Or can we get like a question, oh, just here's something and implements the recursive? Yes, it's possible. So in the exam, it's very possible. Maybe we'd say, for example, right? We'd say now here's a, uh, the method header for insert into sorted list, implement it, right? It might be very similar to how, how, how it was set up for your lab, number six. We might give you the method there. And then we also give you the recursive helper method header. And then you're going to implement both. Okay. We try to be clear, don't worry. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's a key, right? Because usually helper method is recursive, right? Oh, so I would say I'm almost certain. Uh, in case we want you to implement the recursive helper method, only two, uh, only two cases. Either you will be given a precise header for the recursive helper method. So in that case, you don't have to worry about parameters. Or well, number two, you might be asked to come up with a header yourself. So what would be the general strategy? I would say the question you will see in the exam would be very similar to either the one we cover in the slides or the one you saw in the uh, lab six, either way. Yeah, it wouldn't be more difficult than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then because it's just call by value, pass the array reference, and possibly some current index of the array, right? Basically like that. Yeah. And remember the coding bat uh, website I suggested? You should really look at that as well. Okay, that could be useful, coding bat. Okay. Which one, one or two? Uh, I think maybe two is more difficult than one, right? Yeah. Look at two. <laughs> yeah, of course you're gonna look at one first, right? Yeah. yeah, look at both maybe. Yeah, it's good for you anyway. Yeah, you, you definitely have to use a lot of recursion uh, in 2011. Question. Uh, yeah, you'll be definitely given a question for recursion, yes. But you were given some uh, practice questions already. Yeah. Yeah, you better check out. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the practice question I gave to you uh, last weekend. I think that there was a recursion about proving the correctness, for sure. That one, look at that, okay. And also for implementing recursive helper methods, I think we have seen many examples so far. So review the ones we talked about in the class, also in lab six, and look at the coding bed. I think that can also give you a very good idea, okay. In terms of calculating the running time for recursion, Review how we did it for the linear time. You know, like uh, it's, uh, I think uh, it's all positive. Look at how we did it. Also, look at how we did for binary search. Okay, and then a little bit more advanced practice for you is to look at how you unfold the recurrence relation for merge sort. That can be also very useful. Okay. All right. No old question today. It seems like. Well, you guys maybe want to study a little bit. You guys got any more exam before Friday? Yeah. You do? Oh. Okay. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, almost everybody is the same, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. You mean, will you be given the result before the exam? Yeah, yeah, you, you, you gotta look at them too. So you're asking whether they will be uh, written in uh, which ones? Me for the lab test? The oh, you mean the written? Um, maybe not because usually I don't give out the uh, solution for written test. Um, but I would say that one is basically based on what you learn in the lectures, right? Maybe you want to look at those. And also the practice question. Uh, 
How about I use the uh, practice question that I gave to you for written test two? I think they're similar. Okay, did you look at them? Yeah. You did, right? So should we, I guess okay, if I look at one or two of them, will it be okay? okay. Okay, so let me put this away. So let me go to the um, practice questions. Sorry, 2030, and then I'm going for Okay, good. And then if we go to, yeah, for example, this is what you were given for um, lab test two, okay? The written lab test two, okay? So let's talk about this guy here specifically, okay? So now you might be given several classes over here, and then you have to, first of all, draw the inheritance hierarchy. I'm sure you know how to do that, right? So I'll just talk about one example, okay? The casting one. Uh, I can make casting one here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can talk about one example, but to really for the full story, you have to review the slides, okay? Yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, okay, let me see this. We got A extends B, and also B extends C, and also D extends C, and also F extends D, and E extends F. Okay, let me just double check. A extends B, B extends C, and also D extends C, F extends D, and also E extends F. Okay, so that's the kind of inheritance hierarchy you will get. Okay, so let's uh, let's make it up. Let's say the following. Okay, should this compile? Yes? Yes? Why, is the, why does that compile? Yeah, so somehow you know that the proposed dynamic type here, this is a descendant class of D. Okay, good. I'm pretty sure that's what you wrote in the written test. So that one's fine. Okay, so now what I will do is, if I do the following, okay. Oh, let's do this one here. Before I do that, let me just make some assumption here. Let's say in each of the class, for example, in class C, we got a method called CM. And also we got DM over here, and also we got FM. We got EM. We got BM. We got AM. Let's assume. Okay, the pink one just tell, tell us what methods you declare in each class. So now, the green line over here, should it compile? I heard that you will compile, okay. How do you think? Tell us your thought, that's okay, just try. You will compile? Positive. Why would that compile? It's a downward casting, I agree. Okay, good, but that's only part of the story. Because, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you one uh, contrast, okay. Let's say I try exactly the same cast over here, okay. I still cast that into E over here, but now over here, rather than EM, what if I do AM? The point I'm trying to illustrate here is what you have to pay attention to for this line here is not just about the cast itself, but also after the cast, 
how you're using it, right? So now, uh, let's, actually, I think these two examples are good, okay? So that's not, uh, something additional, not really in your practice test. I think that's good, okay? Let me call this guy here uh, number one, okay? Let me call this guy here number two, number one, number two, okay? Should number one compile? Okay, what about number two? I heard that you wouldn't compile, but why? Aha, uh -huh. okay, that's good. Yeah, okay, so now let's think it this way, okay? There are two things we gotta watch for. Number one, for both cases over here, for the cast, we know that it's a downward cast. Because we're casting from D over here into uh, F, oh sorry, D into E. You can see over here, okay, let me make it a little bit more explicit for you. You can see the static type is D, and we are trying to cast that into E, okay? It's a downward casting, okay? So the cast itself is okay. But now we want to think about what you can call after the cast, right? So now you can see that over here, in one case we call EM, in the other case we call AM. So now what would be the expectation on this particular expression over here? So it depends on the cast, right? Okay, so now it's E. So what can we expect on E? You can do EM, you can do FM, you can do DM, you can do CM, right? Basically all the ancestor path methods you can call. So now apparently AM is not one of them. So it's not going to compile, okay? So not compile over here. And this one here will compile. Okay, as far as compilation is concerned, number one is going to compile, number two is not going to compile, okay? What about, okay, given that line, line number one can compile so we can execute it. Jackie, question. Uh, I had a question after you. Though. Okay, so now let's say for the first one here, since it compiles so we can execute it, right? So now what's gonna happen when we execute it? Class cast exception, why? Yeah, you want to be more precise when you answer that, right? So over here, over here, so now, if you think about, yeah. So this guy here, okay, I'll just put it here, okay? What you will get is class cast exception. Okay, you, can, you know how to spell that, okay? Class cast exception, simply because you want to bring dynamic type into play. Dynamic type is simply F. So this is dynamic type, and you're trying to cast that into E. Can F? Satisfy the expectation of E? No. So that's going to be class cast exception. Because dynamic type F is not a descendant of the cast type. So Stephen, just to double check, in the written test, did you did you say descendants or you actually said it does not fulfill the expectation? Or both? Descendants. If I had time, I would say it's not fulfilled the expectation. Yeah, actually I would say, yeah, as I said in the review session, right? I think uh, you, you the perfect answer would be you say it's a descendant class of something, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, for these kind of questions, I think it does because we're uh, the true class cast exception because we're casting into a type that's not an answer to the pattern. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to say if you want to answer this, you want to answer precisely, right? Mention more about descending classes. I think expectation is somehow informal just for getting you the intuition for thinking about the stuff. Right? Okay, as I mentioned before, um, so the, uh, the reason that we really want to cover thoroughly the inheritance topics in this course is because maybe not so much in 2011, but later on when you get to software design or more advanced, uh, or even later on when you work in the industry, if you have to program in some OO language, you have to know inheritance inside out. And uh, polymorphism, dynamic binding, and casting is something you cannot ignore. That's why I spend the time. Okay. But later, if you take uh, 5311 with me again, that's something I'll review. Okay. Yes? Um, what if instead of e object .em, I read e object .dm? Sure. Let me put it down first. So what you're suggesting is 
e over here, obj dot dm. OK, good. Guys, should it compile, first of all? It should compile, right? Good, OK? That's, this one is interesting, OK? Why would it compile? Again, if you think about it, this guy over here is a downcast, right? So now the type over here is E. Is dm expected on E? Yes, of course, dm, what is we draw before, OK? So that compiles. And if you run it, class cast exception. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more question. Okay, one more question. Okay. Let me see this. Give me just one moment. Uh, okay, have a look at this. Number one, we said that it compiles, right? Remember? I'll give you something slightly different, slightly. What's the difference, first of all? Okay, do, do you guys see the difference over here? Okay, the difference is, then this one here, I don't have the parentheses over here. And what's the purpose of the parentheses, as we say in the class, is to force the evaluation, right? If we do have the parentheses over here, that means you're going to do the cast first before you call the method. If you don't have the cast, that means it's as if you put the parentheses over here. Right? Would it compile? Would it? Because now static type is D. Can we expect EM on D? No, because EM is exactly over here. You cannot expect it on D. Okay? It doesn't compile. Does not compile because cannot expect EM on the static type of OBJ, which is D. Okay? I don't think this is on your written test, but anyway, I think that's important to know anyway. Um, are we going to have immutability on? Because I don't remember us mentioning that Immu immutable classes. Immutable classes? No. Because, yeah, because I was doing the practice. Oh, you mean for, yeah. from that, from other section? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think, we, yeah, yeah, I don't think we, uh, I don't think we cover any immutable classes, so you don't have to worry. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as I said, uh, when, we meet, uh, when we meet up together for the other three instructors, I'll make sure everything we cover in the exam is covered in the lecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so immutable, immutable classes, for example, is not. For, for the recursion? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, the proof of that. OK. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, okay, just give me one moment. I want to get I think the one I need uh, let me get a slice first. Give me one moment. Ah, here we go. Okay, and then I'll go here. Okay, the question was really about how to do mathematical induction on the uh, recursion. Okay, let me just again go over the uh, the example we did in class. There was also a practice question for you. Okay, uh, on the uh, over the weekend. Okay, you can look, also look at that. Basically, the the idea is we want to prove the uh, all positive method over here is correct, okay? All positive is calling a recursive helper method here, all positive helper over here, okay? So there are two things to prove. We usually go by proving that the recursive helper method is correct, and then the method itself that calls the recursive helper method is also correct by arguing. It's basically covering the entire length of the array, okay? But let's uh, just talk about uh, conceptually, okay? Um, so that's kind of the pattern we are very used to, you know, in a class. Whenever you talk about some problem on the array, you got to think about three cases at least, okay? You got about two base cases, you got empty array, you got array of size one. 
in the case of empty array, you can see it's not a case that typically from should be less than or equal to two, typically. But now it's completely reversed. So that means it's empty, okay? It's an empty range of indices we're considering. That's empty, okay? And then for array of size one, so from and two, they're talking about exactly the same elements over here, okay? And then we talk about recursive case. Recursive case is actually not too bad, okay? That, this is how you can think of it, okay? So now, think about what we want to do. First of all, we are considering from to two. That's the range we are talking about, okay? However, from to two is a range that's way too big for us to consider at the moment. So what we will do is we're gonna delegate some subproblem of it into the recursion. Okay, so how do we do that? What we do, what we do is, for example, you can see from the method itself, we say return over here, we say call the same helper method over here, but now we say from plus one and then two. So this is how we shrink down the problem by size one. Okay? So now you can think about uh, okay, let me just uh, use some highlighter. You can think about from to two is basically talking about this part of the array, right? The entire array, from to two, okay? But now, if I shrink down the size of the array in the subarray, more precisely, it's from plus one to two. So from plus one is over here, and then all the way to two. So you can see the orange part is definitely a subproblem for the green part, right? Okay, so now, that's a pattern that we have to get used to before we go to the proof. And so now the proof is gonna be very uh, standard, okay? You have to argue case by case. You have to, first of all, argue for base cases. For the empty array, is the method returning the correct result? For the array of size one, is it returning the correct result? And in the case of the recursive case, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to assume something called the inductive hypothesis, right? That's something I assume you have some previous uh, exposure to it, you know, for, in the math classes, okay? But let's uh, see the example, okay? I'll refer back to this diagram in just a moment, okay? Let's get something clean, okay? So now I would say, don't be terrified here. The only thing that would be a little bit, require a little bit more thinking is these two guys over here. These are the only two guys, but we'll get there, okay? So now for the base cases over here, okay, in an empty array, so which line do we handle empty array? Line number three, okay, over here, empty array. And then, so we know that empty array has no uh, all the numbers in empty array is positive because you cannot find anything that's not positive, right? As we say in the class. So it simply return true. Okay, so base case is fine. And then an array of size one. So from is equal to two. In that case, how do we know? Let's say we talk about this particular array. This particular array. How do we know this particular range of uh, the elements are all positive? Well, you simply try to calculate A a position from is larger than zero, that's all you do, right? And that's exactly what the algorithm does over here. That's why I just referring to left four, uh, sorry, line number four. Questions about the base cases? Okay, so to, pro uh, to prove recursion, you have to go for base cases first and then go for recursive case, okay? You okay with the base cases? Good, okay. Oh, okay, sure, no problem, no problem. The inductive, uh, the inductive cases or, or recursive cases. Okay, let's do the part by part. Uh, first of all, let's say this. The inductive hypothesis, let me use the same color. I'm gonna use orange, okay? Orange over here, okay? So we say the following. Let's say this is, uh, we, we are calling over here, we're calling the recursive helper method here by call by value, the same array and also from plus one, and then also two. We are making the following assumption to say that this all positive helper calling on from plus one and two, which correspond to this particular subarray, is going to return us the following result. We can assume that, okay? So what we do is we're going to say returns true if from plus one, from plus two, all the way to two are all positive. Otherwise you return false. This is the assumption. So what we meant was, 
when you are calling this particular recursion over here, you simply assume it is going to work. You just assume it, okay? And then the next step is to think about what about the rest of the array, right? What's the overall array that we are trying to handle? If you think about it, it's here. Uh, this is the array that we are trying to handle. This part here, right? The entire thing. But now, out of this particular array that we want to handle, this part is already assumed, okay? Let me just make it even more explicit for you, okay? Thinking this way. Let's say this is my array. Let's say this is from, this is to, okay? So now let's say the problem we are having is this. Are elements, let's say array A, okay? Just make it simple. Starting from, from A at position from plus one, all the way to a at position two. Our elements all positive. So this is the original problem, okay? I want to know if this particular range over here is all positive. That's my problem, okay? Okay, the green one. So now let's assume the inductive hypothesis. What I'm assuming is this. Inductive hypothesis. Calling, okay, let me just make sure, it's an all positive helper. All positive helper A, okay, the array A over here, and then from plus one, okay? From plus one is exactly over here, okay? And then two, okay, I'm talking about the same two, okay? will return true if eight at position from plus one, and also all the way to a two. You can see the only element that's not covered is a from, right? That's the only element that's not covered. So I'm basically saying this. This guy here, this part of the array, all positive, if all positive helper A from plus one and two, okay, returns true. Okay, that's basically what we're saying. I'm just trying to pre present it in a slightly different angle. Okay, so now the question is, if we know the orange part is something we can assume, but that part is only tells us this particular array, okay? But now, how do we know the answer for this particular strictly bigger array? How do we know that? How can we somehow combine the orange part and A from? How can we combine that? That's a question. Andrew, wanna give it a try? The orange part is gonna be either true or false, right? Okay, let me lead you a little bit, okay? You can think it this way. You can think about here, the all positive A and then from plus one, okay? This guy here is gonna be either true or false, okay? How do you combine the result over here into something to do with this particular element? Let's say A from larger than zero. So this is a Boolean, and this is also another Boolean, right? But somehow, to really know if the green part is actually uh, all positive, there's only a single Boolean we want to return. How do we combine these two Boolean together? And, right? Yeah, exactly. So now you will know that it should be both this element is positive, but also all element in here is also positive, right? For, in this case, you wouldn't choose or, right? You should really make a decision. You want to choose uh, N, okay? So here, choosing the N percent, N percent is really important, right? That's the rest of the proof. You can see, if you look at line number five over here, so whatever we get from here is something we can assume from the inductive hypothesis over here. And this handles, oh, sorry, not here. This part here 
handles this element over here. The way we combine them together is by using conjunction, right? We're saying not only that the first element here is positive, but also the remaining part of the array, which is guaranteed by the inductive hypothesis, is also positive, right? Combine them together, okay? So now if you read the proof a little bit more carefully, okay, the proof over here is simply just say, this is what we expect, how things should happen. Because in order for the green part to be all positive, first element should be positive, and also the remaining part should be positive, right? This part is guaranteed by the inductive hypothesis, no problem, okay? This part here is done in line, uh, in, in line number five over here. And then we're combining them using conjunction. So that's why the whole thing will prove. Okay, one more thing to say. So, so far we only proved, so far we only proved that uh, all positive helper is actually correct. So the final thing left is to prove that all positive over here is also correct, okay? Think about all, what all positive should do. You can think about all positive is taking just A, which means A over here is just an array of something, okay? So now, the way to prove it is by saying, if you look at line number one, the way we implement all positive is by simply calling all positive helper, which we already proved is correct. And now, the way we call that is by giving from being zero, and to being a to length minus one from the beginning until the end. So it's calling correctly. So it's correct. So the main thing is really about how to prove the recursive helper method here, okay? And then over here, it's just about, uh, they're all positive, right? Make sense to you? Yeah, maybe study this example a little bit more carefully. You can ask me again, that's fine. It's actually not trivial. You want to do this one here, also maybe do the exercise I gave to you. Okay. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. It's, it's something definitely you can expect, yes. That's why I'm covering that, right? Yeah, good. All right. Guys, any more questions? But I still got tomorrow and Thursday, so don't worry, right? You can still ask me questions, okay? Yeah, asymptotic analysis, recursion, so these are very fundamental ideas you want to get uh, comfortable with, you know, for all the later courses. So it's worth uh, doing that now. If you feel you're re if, if you're feeling that you're reasonably comfortable with this example here, try the ones uh, I gave to you over the weekend. Try to prove that one, okay? Following the same formats, and then you can compare against the answer, okay? We can also go over that, uh, maybe uh, tomorrow or Thursday, yeah. Oh yeah, so the TA, uh, the TA, I think is finishing up grading the programming test too. So I think I should be able to release it either tonight or tomorrow morning, programming test. For the written test, uh, I think uh, hopefully within uh, two days. I can, but I think the bottom line is I want to give you the test back before the exam. Yes, it's possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Guys, any more questions? Okay, yeah, we spent about 19 minutes today. That's good, okay? But you can ask me more. Maybe tomorrow. Should we call it a day? Or you got more? Any questions for you? You okay? Not yet. Okay. Everybody is happy, at least for now. All right. Yes, questions. Yeah. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. Good. So, for aggregation composition, um, you definitely wouldn't be expected to write copy constructor like uh, what you were asked to write in uh, your programming test, for sure. Okay. However, I haven't seen the questions yet, but so I cannot say something for sure, right? But at least you should know how to trace aliasing for aggregation, right? So you want to be very comfortable with. You remember the faculty, student, and course example we did in the class, right? If we gave you something similar, 
and ask you about the addresses or about expression for the array elements, etc. You should be able to trace them. That's something you've expected. Yes. But we really keep emphasizing aliasing in this course, right? Because that's fundamental. Yeah. Oh, you mean given a oh you mean given a, maybe given a question there Java code and then the answer will just be diagram? No, I don't think so. So somehow we well we're pretty certain that the question the way we ask you the questions will require you to draw the diagram. So we don't need to see your diagram. If you can answer the uh, question correctly, that simply means you can draw the diagram correctly, right? Yeah. But drawing diagrams is very important, right? Yeah. Okay, anything else? All right. How are we call it today? And then tomorrow I'll see you again. Okay. I'll remind you the time, maybe later today.